Hey, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Nevin Gusak, your host uh, for the uh, Populist Patriot. And I'm going to do some live streams uh, today. I have the day off. It's a bit uh, rainy and stormy down here in South Florida. Um, so I'm going to be do doing a couple of live streams. And then a little later on this afternoon at about three o'clock, I have a interview uh, with uh, Tina Trent, who's been on, um, is, who is a blogger, who has been on uh, some programs such as the America Survival Roku TV. Uh, she used to be involved with Americans for Prosperity and is now kind of an independent conservative, very heterodox in my opinion, in her views. And she's going to be a great guest. But right now for today, um, I kind of wanted to go down a little bit on memory lane and you're probably all thinking, how could a hey, 21st century longest? Hey, sup, what's going on? Uh, and you're probably thinking, what in the heck is Nevin talking about here? What in the heck is he talking about? That I'm saying that progressive Democrats are not always wrong on every single issue. Well, let me get my handy dandy Wawa coffee, Wawa coffee, Wawa makes the best coffee out of the fast food place. I'm doing great. Wish I could do paddle boarding 21st century longest, but we got rained out. So instead we're going to do live streams. I got some shows coming up and do my exercise, weightlifting, and then I got to do dance classes. So, okay. So how many of you have heard of uh, Congressman Gerald Nadler? Now, I come from different ideological roots. I used to be a Reagan conservative, then shifted over into the John Birch Society. And then by 2008, by 2008, I started to become, yes, within a framework of a form of capitalism and free enterprise, I became uh, a status and an economic nationalist that emphasizes production over financial speculation and the whole financial casino house of cards economy. Um, and one of the things that changed my mind, and because I used to think Democrats, especially liberal Democrats, were wrong on every issue. But then when I started to read some of their statements on policy, particularly on the reindustrialization of the United States and saving our maritime port infrastructure, because I, I started to take the opinion or have the opinion that, you know what? they actually craft and make really good points and policy decisions because my priority ultimately always was to create a stronger United States of America. Not about my priority freedom was very, liberal freedoms were very important, classical liberal freedoms that is, but I was always guided what I viewed then as a very strong patriotism or what I term a healthy, productive form of nationalism. So when I um, I was involved with uh, New York, Brooklyn and the city of New York Community Board 6, and they had a project to save the container and brake bulk terminals uh along the Brooklyn waterfront, along uh, Buttermilk Channel and Upper New York Bay. Because the city of New York under uh, Mayor Bloomberg and uh, his deputy mayor, Dan Doctoroff, they were from the sort of financial and media industries, really no industrial background really to speak of or manufacturing or maritime background. They hark from the white collar sector they wanted to shut down the container port and convert it into mixed use, including condominiums and other recreational purposes and a scaled down port. And I read that in the newspapers and I was horrified. And it really opened my eyes that this sort of wide open commitment to the so-called 21st century service economy, where every the country will be doing great from the Wall Street centered economy and everybody else can work flipping hamburgers or in the service industries and all the rest of it. Or, hey, take on a lot of college debt and you can become the middle class and you're guaranteed the ticket to a middle class job. Ha ha ha. In these days of mounting college debt by students who actually try to attain 
worthwhile majors in the sciences and teaching and engineering and you know law or business or whatever medicine well anyway so in this effort working with community board six in a now defunct um website called waterfrontmatters.org of which a spin-off project to educate New Yorkers in the local Brooklyn communities about the importance of working at recreational waterfronts, Portside, New York, led by Car Car founded and led by Carolina Salguero. Um, I networked with them and I started to do research for them on articles, digging out documents, using the internet, as well as interlibrary loan. And there are a lot of powerful supporters like Congressman Gerald Nadler, uh, the former city councilman, David Yasky. You had various uh, corporations and labor unions like the International Longshoremen's Association. They supported retaining the maritime industrial purposes, the container handling operations, as well as the brake bulk. Because these, the, these are the industries that built the United States of America. As I've always said, if we sent from the start, if our country centered its economy on the Walmarts and Wall Street, we would have been defeated during World War II. We would have been living the man in the high castle. We would have been occupied by the Nazis, by the German National Socialist, National Socialist Greater Germany. As simple as that. But because we had an industrial infrastructure and we had an FDR administration, for better or for worse, that was guided by the principles, at least outwardly, of national solidarity and of sacrificing of all classes of society for the greater good of the nation, we defeated the National Socialist Greater Germany and Imperial Japan and all the other lesser access powers. So, and I was really struck by this statement of Congressman Gerald Nadler. Now, he harks from a different political tradition. He's Upper West Side in Manhattan, Democratic Socialists of America. These are groups and traditions that I don't come from. I'm not a Marxist or a tanky like DSA. I mean, DSA, yes, they're woke, but they also have a very strong communist contingent, and they have supported Throughout the decades, DSA and its predecessor organization, Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, they've supported a lot of the, of the governments in the world that the tankies have supported. So, and I'm not a tanky, I'm anti tanky in many ways. So, in all ways, actually. So, there's a few things that really, statements that really struck my, really struck a chord with me. And one of the things is um, reading through these statements, and I was like, holy moly, this guy makes sense. And here are the conservatives like City Journal, which is a libertarian conservative publication in New York City, saying that the maritime industrial waterfront should be zoned out of existence. It's old. It's decrepit. You know, it's really not even being used, which is not in, not true in New York City waterfront and everything else for industrial and uh, utility purposes and whatnot. So it was the conservatives that wanted to destroy the port for the most part. And it was the so-called left and labor and certain companies that had an interest to in protecting the port in Red Hook, Brooklyn. So, you know, I mean, this makes sense. I mean, economically, what Nadler is saying makes a hell of a lot more sense than, for example, Ted Cruz's trickle-down economic formulas. So this is a statement at um, the meeting for peers 6 through 12. It's a public meeting. And the city hired a consulting firm, a well-known one called HRNA. And the date was July 30th, 2003. And what Congressman Nadler said was some very good things. And I know I lost a few subscribers and hopefully, and I gained a couple back. 
So make sure you tell people this is not a right wing Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Mark Levin show. This is not a tanky show. This is not a Nazi show. Okay, this is regular radical civic nationalism here. Okay, we're not for a quote big government. It's not a big government versus small government battle necessarily in my eyes. It goes a lot deeper than that when we look at policy, when we look at policies and issues here. So anyways, um, Congressman Nadler says, because we, meaning New York City, have lost a very large percentage of our manufacturing and blue collar jobs, we put an increasing percentage of our economic eggs into a very few baskets, basically finance, insurance, and real estate. We're more dependent on Wall Street, and God bless them, we need those jobs. But Wall Street is an inherently cyclical industry. And when Wall Street booms, we boom. When Wall Street goes into the tank, New York City collapses. We didn't used to because we had enough of an economic base in other areas so that we could absorb it to some extent. Now we don't. It's very foolish to put all of our economic eggs into fewer and fewer baskets, and we ought to be trying to reverse that. I mean, tell me, does that not make sense? Huh? I mean, he's a progressive leftist. But forget his ideological commitment. The face value of his statement is correct. And there were Republicans at the time in New York City under Mayor Giuliani that worked with Nadler's office to promote increased port and industrial operations within New York City, specifically Brooklyn and Staten Island. So yes, progressive leftists can work with Republicans and even conservative Republicans. Another example is when Jesse Helms, who on foreign policy issues is a senator that I like because of his strong anti-communism, and he was an economic protectionist on trade questions. He worked with progressive left Senator Russ Feingold, who, uh, Russ, uh, who was in some ways unfortunately defeated uh, back in 2010, I believe. Um, he's a senator from Wisconsin. And Helms and um, Feingold join hands together to try and defeat permanent normal trade relations for red communist China. But I thought progressive leftists were anti-American and they all are pro-communist. Well, obviously not all of them are. This is why we got to take a look at things in a more nuanced manner because we got to quit the political tribalism thing. We have to look at the issues at hand. And if the Democrats are doing things that are bad for the country, you got to call them out. And when they're doing good things for the country, you got to applaud them. And the same applies to the Republicans too. And of course, we look at these issues through populist and civic nationalist lenses, of course. So... Just looking through some of this here and here. So now Congressman Nadler goes into the economic history of New York City and how New York City and the state of New York in general became the Empire State. Now, I grew up in New York, born in 1974 at NYU Medical Center in Manhattan, and I didn't move to Florida until 1997. So I lived in New York for a quarter of, a, a quarter of my life, really almost a quarter of a century, a few years shy of a quarter of a century. I moved down to South Florida when I was in my early 20s. I'm 47 now. So, so Congressman Nadler says, now let's talk about the port and the maritime use for a moment. New York City grew up because of the port. 
taking a much broader look at city economic policy now. We have huge tax breaks for the financial services industry. If you don't leave, we'll pay Merrill Lynch $65 million not to leave. Essentially, what we're doing is bribing them to stay. And the bribes, by the way, differ depending on whether you have a Democratic or Republican administration. But there are still bribes. If you have a Republican administration, you say, let's bribe the entire class of owners by lowering taxes on upper income people and lowering business taxes. A democratic administration is much more sensitive. No, we shouldn't do that. That takes up too much revenue. We'll bribe them individually. We'll give $65 million to Merrill Lynch and $100 million to CBS and individual industrial retention contracts. But ultimately, you're still bribing them to stay here. Why? Because we have stopped depending on our natural, natural geographic advantage to keep our businesses here. Now, New York is blessed with rivers, bays, creeks, and other, and other waterways, which previous federal and state and city governments took advantage of, that fact. However, they started to get into, remember, this is the 1980s when this started, and everything in America was slowly being deindustrialized, and there was more emphasis on financial speculation, thanks to Ronald Reagan and then his successors, uh, Democrat or Republican. So Nadler has stated, New York grew up and became the outside city it is two and a half times the size of any other American city because we did certain infrastructure projects in the 19th century that enabled us to build on our natural natural geographic advantages. The first was the Erie Canal. We built the Erie Canal that made us the foot, the only way to get to the interior of the continent across the mountains at sea level. And whether you cross the mountains by mule train 150 years ago by flying over it today, it costs money. And by building the Erie Canal, we went from 2% of the nation's maritime commerce to 38% five years later. Then we built the Erie Lackawanna Railroad and kept our transportation advantages. Because of that, we became the major port on the eastern seaboard. And because of that, we got commerce and industry surrounding that. And because of that, in concentric circles, meaning the ripple effect, we got the legal services to service the commerce and industry, printing and everything else. All in concentric circles because we had the port here and we had the port here because we built the Erie Canal and the Erie Lackawanna Can Railroad and took advantage of our natural geographic advantages. For the last 50 or 60 years, we've forgotten about that. We haven't taken advantage of our natural geographic advantages. So this is an... I mean, he obviously mentions quite a bit in this uh, statement he gave at the, uh, the hearings on the future of the container and break bulk um, freighter terminals in Red Hook and Brooklyn and New York City. Um, but when you look at this, when you look at this, and when you look at congressmen when you look at what the congressman nadler says and forget he's a democrat what he says makes sense about infrastructure about how productive economy productiveness manufacturing mining agriculture infrastructure research and development that creates true wealth. So speculation in white, many white collar sectors are dependence on the actual production of real tangible wealth, which is extracted from the soil, it's assembled, manufactured, it's invented, research and development, and it's of course transported using research, uh, transport using infrastructure, and then developed with the best minds, human capital our inventiveness. So 
it was reading with an open mind statements. It was probably um, over 20 years old from Congressman Nadler trying to say in his district, the Red Hook, the breakable piers and industrial development in Brooklyn and save the jobs, save the infrastructure, try and retain somewhat of an economic diversity in New York City. And this opened my eyes and I said, you know what? Here's Congressman Nadler, Democrat, liberal left Democrat, who's actually trying to preserve aspects of America's strength. Now, Nadler, if you look at his history as far back as when he was a state assemblyman in the state of New York's uh, legislature, he always uh, he always had an interest in transportation issues and economic development, particularly with an emphasis on manufacturing and retaining and expanding manufacturing in uh, within the state of New York as well as New York City. So this is where. I started to open my eyes and say, you know what? The Democrats are not always wrong on every single thing. That progressive Democrats will actually fight for aspects of America's strength and wealth creation. And it was the corporate Democrats and the libertarian free market Republicans and so-called conservatives that were anti-industrial. They, I remember at the time there were statements that uh, to the effect that these are uh, from the so-called right in political right in New York City, uh, that, you know, these are old industries and they just want to recreate the 1950s waterfront, notwithstanding the fact that 1950s, the United States was at its zenith in economic power, never mind that, um, you know, because uh, really and truly, the Amer much of the American right in think tank land in Washington, D.C., the congressional right, the Koch brothers' rights and their allies in the state legislatures and the Supreme Court downwards, they really are just protective. They All they want to conserve is the multinational corporations and the Wall Street banks, the private sector oligarchs, and basically crush labor. That's essentially what it's all about. So I wanted to share this with you because it gives you a little bird's eye view on my intellectual development, how I became a populist and how I became, I tended to, I tend to look um, now at fighting political battles in a transpartisan fashion. So as I said, Congressman Nadler, I mean, he's more right. I mean, he would have been a better nominee and for secretary of transportation um, in the Trump administration or the Biden administration. I mean, there you go. But now Trump's administration, you had Elaine Chao, who is basically an agent of influence for the People's Republic of Communist China. And during the Trump so-called America First Trump administration, Elaine Chao and the rest of the Trump administration actually acts plans to launch an America first uh, shipbuilding uh, industry to revamp that because that's been gutted starting under Reagan's withdrawal of the construction differential subsidies in 1981, all in the name of the market. So to me, when I'm hiring somebody for politics, you look for somebody who has the brain power and the commitment. I mean, irrespective of whether you're Democrat or Republican. And don't tell me these Democrats, oh, they're, they're just the Communist Party, because a lot of Republicans, you know, at one time, particularly before Trump, Ron Johnson, Ted Cruz and everything, they went to bat for the economic interests of the People's Republic of Communist China. Okay, before Trump made it cool to take a look at the economic and national security threat of China. So don't give me that, you know? And then you have that, uh, uh, that oh, what's his name? Justin Amash, um, 
former uh, the congressman from Michigan, who is a Republican now, independent, a hardcore libertarian. Uh, you know, he his business interests are, are intertwined with communist China, as revealed, because he I mean he opposed the uh, tariffs that the Trump administration levied on dumped communist Chinese goods. So don't tell me it's just oh Democrats are the Communist Party and the Republicans they're good or the lesser two evils. So you got to vote Republican. No, you got to pull them all out when they're wrong. Okay. In this case, Congressman Adler is right. And I wanted to give you examples of what he said and make you think that, you know what? He was actually on the right side of this issue. And you know what? We need to stop this shit about political tribalism. Because in many ways, having our political party system the way it's configured right now is proving to be a disaster for this country. The only home team this country should be rooting for is the home team. Uh, for promoting American interests first, for rebuilding the strength and power of the United States. So now I see a whole bunch of comments here. Thank you all for listening. Uh, 21st century longest. I remember back in the 1930s, there were Republicans who weren't entirely opposed to the New Deal, like Wendell Wilkie. That's very true. Um, even Bob Robert Taft of Ohio um, I think there was a biography written by Russell Kirk about Taft and even Taft. And I cover it in my, I believe in my turning the page, I think, where even Taft said, uh, supported uh, the existence of unions, even though he was a, uh, a proponent of right to work. He still supported unions. He still supported aspects of progressive legislation and coming in to terms with the New Deal. So you're absolutely right. There were some Republicans that uh, that did not entirely oppose the New Deal, even ones that were normally staunch critics in the New Deal. Uh, yeah, you had conservative Democrats who opposed the New Deal, particularly in the South, the Bourbon Democrats. Now, some of the Southern Democrats were also segregationists. They were populists, and they supported the New Deal as long as it was kept within the confines of white supremacy. Um, uh, John, Rankin, uh, John Rankin of Mississippi and Theodore Bilbo, uh, also of Mississippi, are some examples of that. You had elements within the white racial segregationist political community in the South that supported the New Deal and supported populist reforms. Um, unfortunately, they misuse it, particularly like Governor Bilbo, to promote a semi-authoritarian political power, and that I oppose, of course. And I oppose racialism, of course, of any kind. Um, yeah, John Nance Garner, he, yeah, yeah, John Nance Garner, who was FDR's first vice president, if I recall correctly, he was an opponent of the New Deal to, uh, to a degree. Uh, good evening, Nevin. Nevin, what do you think about the war in Ukraine? Jeff says the Russians are losing, but I think he forgot everything. Just because the Russians are avoiding losses, he simply said they lost and they're weak and corrupt. Um... I think it remains to be seen. There are differing narratives about what's going on in the war of Ukraine. Some narratives speak of Maria Paul falling and the cessation of combat duty. That's what the Ukrainians are saying, per se, with the Azov Battalion and whatnot. So I think we just have to wait and see how things pan out. Um, I just think we have to have a cautious amount of skepticism for both for what both the Ukrainians and the Russians are saying, because they all want to make their sides look good, essentially. So they want to say one, you know, Ukrainians are going to want to say that their side is winning. They want to project a positive image so they continue to maintain uh, the world's sympathy. And the Russians are, of course, are going to want to say that they have these you know, of course, they're talking about that they have these new weapons like special lasers and whatnot, if I recall correctly, and say that they're winning. So I think it remains to be seen. But once it becomes clear, if they're indeed Maria Paul Falls, then I think, uh, you know, pretty much the jury is in on that. 21st century uh, longest. I don't know if you already know this, but as a radical civic nationalist, some of your beliefs might align uh with the political platform of the new frontier 
Oh, yes, that's Culture at Thug's channel, yes. Uh, Culture Thug as well as other people. Um, there is some overlap. I mean, they their traditions are more in the fascist variant. I'm not a fascist. I mean, I'd be willing to talk to most people. I'm pretty blunt with my, I'm pretty much open and honest with my views, but I pretty much enjoy having political conversations with most people. Um, you know, I have really firm disagreements with all variants of fascism because of, you know, the crimes against humanity committed by various fascist uh, police states, uh, as well as their greater national socialist, greater Germany and imperial Japan's uh, uh, for global hegemony, I have a real issue with that. Uh, and they're also far more statist politically and economically than even I am. They are much more for the scientific management of all groups of civil, civil society, more than even I would argue for that. Um, okay, Nevin, can you do a video about your predictions about the whole Russian-Chinese plans? I do have a video uh, that was done early last year, I think March or April, where I talk about Red Dawn, uh, whether it was a reality or not. I really go into a lot of details. You also mentioned they use a bunch of hypersonics, T-90s. Oh, yeah, yeah, SU-57s. A big war is happening in Europe since Finland and Sweden are joining NATO. I think we have to keep an eye on the news. Uh, you know, I know that sounds like a very fast, fast, facile answer. I think we have to keep an eye on the news. Yes, the Russian side is talking about using all this heavy technology. Uh, certainly the javelins or missiles that the United States have exported to the Ukrainian armed forces definitely has been helping. Um, but, you know, it just everything I think remains to be seen. Um, it really remains to be seen. But I... I wouldn't uh, poke the bear in the eye either. We have to have a very careful policy with Russia and China. Uh, what if Russia is draining Western weapons? It, you know, the Russians are very strategic. I mean, we have to remember the oligarchs around and Putin himself and the economic oligarchs and the Russian intelligence services, the Russian armed forces, both in a positive and negative sense, are products of the Soviet system. So they're going to use successful um, Soviet tools to try and out with the West as a whole. And even if the Russians are... Even if the Russians are losing on the, on the military front in Ukraine, they still are very proficient at political warfare. And already, uh, whether you agree with this or not, I mean, they already have Republicans in the House and the Senate that are basically looking to really pare back support, if not cut off support for Ukraine, too, as well. And, you know, I would be curious to see what kind of Russian interests have pushed these, has pushed or lobbied indirectly or directly these congressmen and senators uh, to... Um, to, for example, uh, vote no or pressure the United States not to give, what is it, the $40 billion in assistance to Ukraine. And I have my own opinions on that. Uh, I, When it comes to intervening in foreign conflicts, I tend to be very leery of that. Germany is out of weapons stockpiles. The way I see it, the Russians are not focused on gaining ground, but to destroy forces. Yeah, the Russians are there for the long haul. Yeah, there's no doubt about that, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I, you know, what I think we need to do, quite honestly, and I'm sorry, my Russian, I believe that's a Russian language you read, a Cyrillic script, so I apologize if I don't, I don't read a Cyrillic, so my deepest apologies. Um, what I would do is I would really focus on the American home front and protecting the home population against Russian and Chinese attack. And I would reindustrialize the United States and I would kind of reorient our economic system into a way that wins support of all sectors because more and more people are being pushed to the left. Uh, and that is because really the re very real abuses and increases in cost of living that uh, is a result of the greed of corporate capitalism.
It's not big government. It's not the socialists in the United States that's causing this. So, but what we can talk about it in a different show. I really digress. Thank you all for your comments. I'm going to be doing a couple of more uh, episodes, and then I'll be going on with Tina Trent. It's not going to be um, a live stream, but I will try and have it up uh, tonight. Uh, what do I think about Biden? Uh, Biden, I never supported, never liked Biden. Democrats, um, you know, basically the corporate Democrats, the established Democrats are trying to, especially Joe Manchin and the uh, and Kristen Cinema, uh, they basically are trying to kill populist reforms. Essentially, uh, that's how I see it. Um, and you know, they're going to cost the Democrats the election because Biden is not a fighter for populist reform. He doesn't have that background. Um, you know, it's 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 a huge issue uh, with that. Uh, what are your thoughts on the forty billion dollars to Ukraine? Um, I'm very split on that. I mean, to be honest with you, we need to strengthen in our own country internally. I mean, I'm all for preserving Ukraine's independence to a degree. Uh, but frankly, we're just not strong enough to overly provoke the Russians and the Chinese who are allies together. So we need to plow that, put that $40 billion. We need to, uh, we need to really put 40, 40 billion dollars, if not a lot more, into uh, enacting populist reforms in this country, revitalizing our civil defense, uh, anti-missile defense, uh, revitalizing our nuclear deterrent or nuclear war fighting force, uh, revitalizing our infrastructure, including high, uh, nationwide high-speed rail, uh, you know, rural broadband. I mean, the whole list goes on and on and on because without a strong America, 21st century longest, we can't be good for any other country. Because in my opinion, our many of our fundamentals in this country have been badly neglected because of, you know, this notion that the Cold War ended, which it really didn't, as well as also the warship at the altar of market fundamentalism and greed is good as a, uh, in a, economics. So that's my take. Glad you guys agree. You all have a great day. I'm going to be coming back on in a few minutes, so don't go away.